Ladies and gentlemen, Marshall Brown. Hi, I'm Marshall Brown. Welcome back to Water Matters. My guest this week is Enrico Nardone, the director of the SeaTuck Environmental Center in Iceland. Prior to joining SeaTuck in 2001, Enrico was a lawyer in private practice and a staff attorney with the National Audubon Society. An avid birder and environmental educator, Enrico is an expert on Long Island's unique migratory fish populations. After his presentation, we'll talk about how our human activities are impacting the fish and other wildlife on Long Island. That's all coming up on this edition of Water Matters. So don't go away, we'll be right back. From the Grassroots Studio in beautiful downtown Port Washington, this is Water Matters with host Marshall Brown and special guest Enrico Nardone. Brought to you by the Jump In Campaign and made possible in part by funding from the Long Island Community Foundation. And now, here again is your host, Marshall Brown. Hello and welcome back to Water Matters. As advertised, we have here Enrico Nardone, Executive Director of uh, the SeaTuck Environmental Association. Right. Enrico, I'm really looking forward to this. I'm sure the audience is as well. Thank you. And um, eager to talk with you about your presentation afterwards. Great. Look forward Go to get it. Go get them. Thank you. Well, thank you. It's nice to be here. Um, I've enjoyed uh, the program so far. It's been an impressive collection of speakers uh, to precede me here, an esteemed and uh, highly respected group. Um, sorry to be breaking your streak today, but I'm nevertheless honored to join their company. So Long Island, as we know, is blessed with many coastal rivers and streams. Uh, these streams are a direct legacy of Long Island's glacial history. Um, Long Island, as the glaciers stopped here, formed a vast outwash plain of sand, and then as the meltwater ran across that sand, formed a, a vast network of channels and braided systems across the sand. On the north shore, uh, the uh, water melting directly under the glaciers carved out deep valleys into the, into the sound. And these channels and valleys, where they remain today, um, you can see in, on this great digital, digital elevation map of Long Island, the, 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 the extent, especially on the south shore, of how many uh, nooks and crannies there were to, this out, to these outwash plains. Uh, where these valleys and channels uh, intersect with the water table, we have the, the streams uh, that persist today. They're mostly shallow, mostly small, but all groundwater fed with this sort of cold, clear water coming up and supporting an, ab an abundance of freshwater species and uh, as a, an integral part of Long Island's terrestrial landscape. But our focus today is on their connection to the estuary and their role in the broader coastal ecosystem. That role starts with the story of diadromous fish. These are species of fish um, that have a, a very unique life cycle. And the word diadromous is a Greek word that has its root, uh, for, uh, means running or course. And dia is through. So these are fish that run through different habitats from uh, one to another. And they, they split their life cycle between saltwater and freshwater. Most freshwater fish uh, cannot tolerate saltwater and vice versa. So these are a very unique uh, collection of, uh, of fish that can move back and forth effortlessly between the two. There's two main categories of diadromy. The first is catadromy, so catadromous fish. There's that root running again, and these are fish that run down. So fish that spend most of their lives in freshwater and migrate out to the sea to spawn. Uh, we have one catadromous fish in Long Island. Anybody know the catadromous fish? The American eel, uh, an amazing fish. Scientists are still trying to fully understand its life cycle, but every American eel from anywhere in its habitat starts its life in the middle of the North Atlantic in the middle of these big ocean 
currents in a place called the Sargasso Sea. Uh, they hatch there. They're tiny leaf-shaped larvae that are planktonic. They, they drift around in these currents. As they get to the coast, they go through this transformation um, triggered by temperature, scientists believe, uh, to become eel-shaped, and they start uh, swimming. They're translucent at that point. They're called glass eels. As they make their way into the estuaries, they start gaining pigment and become elvers and start swimming their way up our tributaries. And their range historically from the, from the northern end of South America all throughout the Gulf of Mexico, up the Rio Grande River, the full extent of the Mississippi system, and then basically every waterway up and down the East Coast to Canada. As they move up river, they become yellow on the underbody. They, they become what are known as yellow eels. And they spend the next 10 to 30, potentially even 40 years in the river growing, growing, growing. And in many places, they represent more of the biomass uh, than any other single animal species. And there's lots of them out there where the populations are healthy and they're feeding lots of species there, lots of wading birds, uh, cormorants like to throw them up in the air apparently. And if you don't think there's any value to them, this is an amazing picture of an adult eagle feeding a yellow eel to its young. Uh, at some point, and again, scientists aren't exactly sure what triggers this, but they transform into silver eels. This is their final transformation, and they become, they reach sexual maturity and reverse this course. They go swim downstream, back through the estuaries, and potentially, in some cases, thousands of miles back out to the Sargasso Sea, where they start this cycle over again, they spawn, and then they die. Uh, an amazing story for our only catadromous fish. Uh, the other, other category of diadromy is anadromy. These are anadromous fish. Um, there's that root running again. These are fish that run up. So fish that spend most of their lives at sea, but migrate into fresh water to spawn. Uh, the one that everybody knows from National Geographic and the Discovery Channel uh, it's the Pacific salmon. These are the fish jumping up waterfalls and over grizzly bears. Um, we don't have any salmon here in Long Island. The Atlantic salmon uh, came as far south as the Connecticut River, but not past that. But we do have bigger uh, anadromous species in our region, Atlantic sturgeon, striped bass, American shad. Uh, but none of these fish on Long Island because our systems are too small. They require big rivers. These are fish that migrate up uh, the Hudson, for example. Our anadromous fish are two species, alewife and blueback herring. Uh, very easy to tell apart in this illustration, not so much in real life. There are some differences, but we generally class them together as river herring. And they're both sort of foot-long fish, highly migratory, uh, schooling fish out in the ocean. And during most of the year, they're offshore on the continental shelf. Again, scientists don't know a lot about what's going on out there, but they're off the Gulf of Maine and up along the coast of Newfoundland. And while they're out there, and this will be a recurring story, they're helping to drive this big ocean o ecosystem there. So all these big pelagic predators are feeding on them, from whales to dolphins to tuna. Uh, and then in the winter, late winter, they start their movement uh, into their spawning uh, migration, uh, drifting into their, they're trying to find their natal stream, so up and down the coast. The blue lines actually represent the blueback herring. The blueback go further south than alewives. They go stretch all the way down to uh, Florida. Uh, alewife are not further south than the Carolinas. But they find their way into the estuaries, and again, there's a whole other cast of characters waiting for them. So in the, at the end of the winter, as these species themselves are getting ready to the, prepare for their own spawning season, there's this tremendous influx of fish coming in to, to, for them to uh, feed on. Uh, striped bass, bluefish, seals, all uh, taking advantage of the bounty from the ocean. And then when the time is right, and I have time in quotes because the fish don't actually care about the time or what day it is, they're really focused on temperature. So it's the temperature of the water flowing out of the rivers. When it gets to be about 48 degrees, maybe 46, maybe 49, that's what triggers their movement upstream. And they get in to shallow water. They're moving upstream. Uh, they're quite capable swimmers. They can't jump up over a grizzly bear like a salmon can, but they can navigate uh, strong currents and some barriers where there's water for them to swim in. They're not jumpers. 
And again, back to the story, uh, as they move into the rivers now, a whole other group waiting for them uh, to feed and take advantage of this bounty. River otters trying to make a comeback on Long Island, uh, raccoons, and a host of different birds. Uh, this is a bird named a herring gull, uh, primarily because of its, uh, uh, its uh, taste for herring. Uh, when these runs are on in, in places in, in New England, you can find herring gulls lining the shores waiting for these fish. Here's two herring gulls fighting over an alewife. And of course, Osprey. Osprey on Long Island, the return, everybody always says St. Patrick's Day, mid-March, precisely at the time when the alewife runs are coming. So they're coming after long migration, getting ready for their nesting season at precisely the time the rivers are being filled with these fish for them to prey on. This time of year, if you see an, uh, an osprey carrying a fish, chances are it's going to be an alewife. And the fish are moving upstream, trying to find nice uh, ideal habitat. And there is a difference here. Alewife are after this kind of habitat. They're flat water spawners, nice calm flat water, whereas blueback want more uh, moving flowing current. Uh, each female can lay up to a quarter million eggs. And then when the spawn is, these are not nest builders, they're, they're broadcast spawners, so they're spawning in the water column. Uh, after that's done, the, the adults go back to the ocean. They're in the system for a couple of days, um, maybe a week or so, and then back out to the ocean. They leave these eggs behind, and then the fry hatch. And I tell people, if you're not already passionate about these fish, this picture will get you. This is the cutest little fish you'll ever see, right? Uh, that's a young alewife, probably just a few weeks old. But they, they start immediately moving uh, downstream and growing and feeding, and they make their way into the estuary and eventually back out to the ocean. Uh, by the time that happens, they're a, a year old, about three inches long, and eventually off and schooling in, in age groups on the ocean and eventually uh, joining the larger groups and they stay out there for three or four years before reaching, reaching maturity and making their first spawning run back to their natal stream. The third category of diadromous fish is not really a category as much as it's an in-between category. These are not fully resident fish and not fully migratory fish. They're what, we're call, what are called semi-anadromous fish. And these are fish that, for our purposes, are freshwater fish, essentially, that are able to tolerate salt water and they can go out into the estuary to forage and can survive there. Uh, there's a couple species of, of perch that can do that, but the one we focus on mostly uh, is the brook trout. And the brook trout, when it goes out into the estuary to feed, uh, loses its pigmentation, becomes this beautiful silver color, and they're known as sea run or salter brook trout. And there's an interesting history on Long Island with these fish because uh, when the south shore of Long Island was, it was a popular destination for, for New York sportsmen to come out and hunt and fish, uh, part of that popularity was that the coastal streams were full of huge trout because they were able to go out into the estuary, take advantage of all the food there, and come back in as, as, as big trout. So uh, there's some, some cultural tie to uh, the sea run brook trout on Long Island. So how are these fish doing? Well, uh, I wouldn't be here talking about it if everything was hunky-dory, obviously. And there's lots of data out there about fish landings and, and uh, population, um, they've been all under some consideration or listing for protection on different levels. But I'd like to summarize the story in one picture. And if you look carefully, you can see this alewife is clearly sad and frowning. And that's basically the story here, is that they're, they're just not doing well uh, across, their, across their range. Why? Well, it relates to the fact that these are highly migratory fish. They, they're in salt and freshwater, crossing lots of jurisdictions, and difficult to uh, protect in any, in any one way. Um, this chart you sort of shows the distinction between the saltwater and freshwater issues. On the saltwater side, uh, these fish are subject to direct catch or bycatch. Uh, eels are harvested as, as those glass eels that come into the estuary. Um, river herring are not targeted so much as they're caught up in bycatch. They're, they're out there on the continental shelf with other target species like Atlantic herring and mackerel, and they get caught up in these huge nets. There's great concern about the impact that these huge fishing uh, systems are having on uh, river herring on, out on the continental shelf. Um, but all these fish are suffering on the freshwater side from water quality. Uh, they're all subject to different degrees to, um, to pollution, probably brook trout the most, 
sensitive to, to needing really good clean water. And then our focus at SeaTuck is on the habitat side. And this is just getting at this issue of these fish are migratory, they need to be able to move from fresh to salt water, and we've done a very good job of pre uh, preventing that. When we say habitat loss, we're mostly talking about dams, walls of concrete that these fish just cannot navigate. This is uh, a dam in Hards Lake in South Haven County Park. Uh, that, that's why this dam was built, was a, it was a power of mill, like lots of dams were on Long Island. But it not, wasn't just mills, we also impounded uh, tributaries for the commercial cranberry production and for ice harvesting. I tell the story to kids, they want to know why didn't they just get their ice from the refrigerator or the, the ice maker? Uh, because this is how we got ice and, and we collected it and put it in, 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 in barns and hay and, and kept it for the summer. And lots of tributaries in Long Island were impounded for this purpose. And we say a, uh, a tributary was dammed, and uh, I don't want to give the impression that it was a single dam. In most cases, it's multiple dams. And this is an extreme case, the Browns River in Bayport. Uh, more than a dozen impoundments up and down the river, uh, and everywhere on that right column where it says permanent, these are places where the fish just simply cannot navigate. It's not just dams, it's also culverts. So that situation on the Browns River is a place where you have a per what's called a perched culvert. So these are road and railroad crossings, and the culvert is perched uh, often over low tide, but on high tide, uh, the fish can get up and get through. But this is another big problem. It's not always the dams, it's often the impoundments themselves that are barriers for migratory fish. So why should we care? We have a problem, these fish are not doing well. Uh, why is it important? We go back to all of these species that are feeding on these fish. And their fish, in, in most cases, are are taking energy of the ocean and transporting it into our upland habitats. And as I mentioned, precisely at a time when a lot of species are getting ready for their own spawning and breeding seasons. And all these pictures are focusing on, on predators eating adult fish. Think about all of those eggs being laid, all of those tiny glass eels swimming into the estuaries, all of those tiny super cute alewives and river herring drifting out into the ocean, into the estuary. All of those are feeding lots and lots of other smaller predators out there. Um, it's, it's hard to find something that doesn't feed on one of these species. It's, it's really not an over uh, uh, exaggeration to say that these fish are really helping to drive our entire coastal ecosystem. Uh, we call them um, keystone species in that regard, species that the entire ecosystem is built upon. So what can we do to try to address this habitat loss? Um, we're trying to reconnect these rivers and get these fish uh, past some of these barriers. Uh, for the past seven or eight years, we've been working to reconnect and restore, and mostly that's been through fish ladders. So this is that same Hards Lake Dam. This is the first permanently installed fish ladder on Long Island. And the, the great story about this, the workers, as they were literally finishing bolting this thing to the dam, or to the, to the dam in early uh, March that year, and they lifted the boards out, the fish were already there and immediately, within an hour or so, started coming up the ladder. Um, they, they are trying to go upstream, they can smell that flowing water and they follow it. Uh, it's, a, it's sort of, if you build it, they will come kind of a story. Uh, this is a rock ramp built on the Peconic River in Riverhead, not a metal box, but a, a, a spillway removed and then a, a sort of a natural looking stream built there that the fish can navigate. This is a fish ladder at Massapequa Lake in Massapequa. And Argyle Lake in Babylon, this historic Argyle Lake facade, uh, we were able to convince the village of Babylon to install a fishway uh, on the side of it there. And you can see in this photograph the, the baffles in the bottom. So the goal of these fishways is, uh, is to slow down the water and create eddies. So these fish, I mentioned, they're not jumpers, but they're very capable swimmers. So they get in there and the, the baffles create eddies where they can jump from one to another and make their way upstream. Fish ladders are not perfect. Not every fish gets up. There is a certain percentage that just won't do it and, or can't navigate it, can't find it. The issue of attraction flow is often a big one. They, they get stuck in the wrong spot of the spillway and it's hard to get the fish to recognize that as a way to um, navigate upstream. And so this is a scene that we're hoping to bring to Long Island. Um, the perfect fix for, for reconnecting tributaries and advancing migration rates is to remove some of these dams that, as I mentioned, were built to power mills, 
uh, harvest cranberries and, and create ice, none of which we need anymore. And there were some impoundments built for recreational purposes and aesthetic purposes and are still serving those, those goals, but a lot of our dams are just uh, persisting f with no actual purpose. Uh, we are trying to put a, create a crack in the, in the dam and, and start this process on Long Island and, and, and get people to understand that there's a river under that impoundment there that, that wants to be a stream. There's still a stream there. This is a, uh, a restored tr uh, stream from Vermont. And when the impoundments are removed, these streams very easily uh, reform their historic channels. And it doesn't take a lot to restore these areas. People. I think envision too often that they're going to be left with a muddy mess, but these things very quickly regrow and renaturalize and turn into beautiful uh, streamside meadows and eventually forests. So this is our goal. We're trying to uh, advance this across the island. Uh, we recognize that not every impoundment can be removed. That people live on lots of them. That they're uh, a, a central part of uh, some of our historic towns and villages, and people are attached to them. But there's a, there's a point at which uh, we have to sort of, you know, it's all sort of relative. People tell me all the time, well, my grandmother ice skated on that pond when she was a kid. And I like to tell people, well, that's nice, that's nice, and I, I appreciate that. But for 10,000 years before your grandmother was ice skating, there were fish swimming in a river in that spot. And, and then the other piece is it's not just about the ecological um, recovery. The, the dams themselves are not free. They, there's a cost associated with maintaining impoundments. Uh, whether it's from the maintenance of the dam itself or from the issues associated with these impoundments as they silt in and then start to grow uh, aquatic vegetation. Uh, the town of Brookhaven is going to spend $4 million, I think, this summer trying to address uh, aquatic vegetation in one of the impoundments on the Carmen's River. So, uh, it, you know, we're trying to get people to understand that there's an economic cost to impoundments, there's not a lot of benefit to impoundments, and there's, on the other hand, a lot of ecological gain to be made by allowing these streams to run. So uh, that's our goal, trying to advance connectivity through fish passages and dam removal where possible, uh, restoring these fish to the, um, to the great benefit of our, our, our entire uh, coastal ecosystem. Thank you. If we're going to solve our water issues on Long Island, we'll need an informed public. Jump in print materials about water issues on Long Island can be co-branded with your organization's logo and are available at no cost to local nonprofits on Long Island and for minimal cost to local agencies and water departments. To learn more, please visit our website at liwater.org or call our office for more information. Let's spread the word about Long Island's water. Long Island's water quality is declining, and there's a major push to clean it up. All of our water comes from underground aquifers. What gets into the ground gets into the water that we drink, cook with, and bathe our children in. It also contaminates the places where we swim, boat, and fish. Here's something we can all do at home to help. Stop throwing out pollutants programs. Provide homeowners with a safe and environmentally sound way to keep hazardous materials out of our groundwater. Stop programs accept anything from paint, antifreeze, bleach, and pesticides to household and car batteries, propane tanks, and compact fluorescent lamps. Explain to your whole family how proper disposal of these toxins can improve our water quality. Visit your town or local municipality's website for a complete list of stop locations and hours of operation. Not only will this help to protect Long Island's water, but it will also be a learning experience for your children and family. Remember, protecting Long Island's water starts at home. If you get sick, your doctor may give you medicine, and you might have some left over when you get better. So what do you do with it? Here's what. Don't ever, ever, like ever, flush drugs down the drain, because we're beginning to find them in our water here on Long Island. See, whatever goes down the drain ends up in our drinking water or in our bays and streams. So jump in and help keep Long Island's water clean. Don't flush medicines down the drain. Learn more at liwater.org. Welcome back to Water Matters. Again, my guest, T. 
here today is Enrico Nardon, Executive Director of the CTUC Environmental Association. Enrico, that was an amazing presentation. Thank you. Uh, I learned some uh, $10 Greek words uh, uh, and really uh, came to much greater understanding as to uh, these migratory fish and why they're so important for the larger ecosystem. Thank Good. you for I'm that. Glad. Thank you. Yeah. Well, first of all, I, I want to have you talk to the audience a bit about Sea uh, Talk because it's just such a marvelous institution and uh, definitely worth a visit, everybody. Yeah, so the, the work we're doing with migratory fish is part of our, our uh, policy side. We're involved in other efforts uh, to restore and protect horseshoe crabs and, and uh, the American chestnut tree and other efforts. But a lot of what we do is uh, on the education side. So we're, we're engaged in efforts to try to connect people to the natural world. And, uh, and, and especially kids, we're trying to grow future conservationists. And that starts with some basic experiences in nature. So uh, we're involved in operating a couple of nature centers. We run the Suffolk County Environmental Center where we're based in Islip, uh, the South Shore Nature Center through a partnership with the town of Islip in East Islip. And we run an outdoor education program at the Sherwood Jane Farm in East Setauket through a partnership with SPLEA, the Society for the Preservation of Long Island Antiquities. And uh, we're doing uh, as many, you know, any and everything we can do to get people and, and children outside uh, at uh, different you know, school groups, uh, scout groups. Uh, we run uh, a drop-off preschool program, the first of its kind in Suffolk County, where the kids are basically outside all the time, unless it's dangerous out they're outdoors. Um, and then lots of, uh, we, we do a lot of work with teachers too, workshops. We're involved with this Green Tree Teachers Ecology Workshop. And, uh, you know, instead of focusing on parents and, and caregivers to get the kids outside, this idea that they're with their teachers a lot of the time and uh, trying to get the teachers more comfortable in uh, getting children outside and, and instead of connecting them to uh, the, the rainforest or, or, the, or the Antarctic ecosystems, getting the teachers comfortable talking about Long Island's ecology and connecting kids uh, to the places that they see outside their own uh, homes. So. Um, uh, so yeah, so that, uh, our, our main office at the Suffolk County Environmental Center is at the spectacular Scully Estate. It's a historic building, one-of-a-kind structure. It's beautiful. It's a beautiful old building, and uh, we, have a, we have an Earth Day celebration there coming up called the Eco Carnival uh, on the 16th. Um, again, designed around a series of nature stations designed to get mm -hmm. kids... Uh, That's get their, 11 to 4. 11 to 4, to get their hands dirty and uh, have some authentic uh, nature experiences. So it's a fun event. Mm -hmm. And you're, you mentioned the uh, the preschool program, the uh, Little Peepers. You little call? Peepers, right? Mm -hmm. And is uh, registration open for that now? Always taking, uh, always trying to take uh, new kids on. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now you're an avid birder. Uh, avid amateur birder. <laughs> um, what's uh, what's your next big birding event? Uh, our next, well, our, we actually have uh, we launched uh, two years ago the um, Sea Tuck Birding Challenge. So we do this mm -hmm. in the fall, not mm -hmm. the spring, um, but it's uh, an effort to try to uh, promote open spaces on Long Island, promote uh, bird conservation, and you know, birding is a great way to connect to the natural world. So we're trying to get, uh, we have some hotshot birding teams to participate, but we're most interested in trying to get uh, teachers with to get school teams together, and, and we have some great family teams. So trying to sort of get people out. It's a 12-hour it's a competition uh, in late September. Mm -hmm. um, so, but, you know, the, one of the best times of the year is coming up to get out and see birds. The mm -hmm. spring migration is, uh, is on the verge of starting, so mm -hmm. any time over the next several weeks is a great time. And they, they love that Sea Tuck property, too. They do. It's pretty good. Pretty good birding, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, people always strikes people that the best birding on Long Island is really on the western part of the island mm -hmm. because it's more directly over the Atlantic Flyway. Mm -hmm. And uh, and a lot of East Enders get frustrated that there's better birds in, in Prospect Park and mm -hmm. in Brooklyn than there are in the East End, but that's, that's just that's the mm -hmm. nature of the migratory routes. Well, you have the, the least turn, uh, an endangered bird that you've uh, been instrumental in helping to protect. Well, Sea Tuck's history, when Sea Tuck originally was, before it was incorporated as a nonprofit, was an informal partnership with the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was based at the Sea Tuck Refuge in Islip and uh, staffed by PhD uh, scientists who were conducting different research projects. Uh, one of which was helping to demonstrate the, the struggles that the least tern was having and other colonial nesting birds. But uh, their data helped uh, get protection for the least tern and, uh, you know, they're trying to turn, turn that population around. So that's why our logo features the least tern. Uh -huh. uh, let's uh, talk about uh, creeks and, and dams a bit. Uh, spring is upon us. 
people are looking around and, and, and trying to uh, figure out what they could do to help the local environment. There are these uh, spontaneous uh, cleanups I'm seeing in various uh, creeks uh, along the South Shore. Um, which, uh, which creek do you feel really uh, needs a, a steward or a champion? Well, they all do. Of course, I mean, they, I mean, they all do. There's, you know, there's there, there's some celebrated uh, systems on Long Island. People love the the Peconic and the Carmens and the and the Carl's River. But uh, especially as you go west, where the streams have been so marginalized, uh, buried in many cases, uh, built over, uh, fenced off, and forgotten about. I mean, there's many streams uh, that you can barely even see, mm -hmm. let alone enjoy, and uh, in that part of the island. Um, you, know, you could have your pick, but um, there's some I think that are are, are there's still substantial enough. There's still enough of a corridor mm -hmm. uh, left that the stream have potential to, for restoration. So uh, we're involved in working with the state actually with some post Sandy funding on the Mill River okay. that flows through Oceanside and Rockville Center and um, up eventually into Hempstead Lake State Park. So it's a it's a spectacular system with lots of potential. Mm -hmm. But going uh, going east from there, um, you know through Baldwin and Freeport and, and into Belmore and Wanta, yeah, there's a host of these streams. Um, the Meadowbrook system, for example, like, the, you know, the things we did to tributaries decades ago just, ma you know, makes me sick sometimes how we mm. just, you know. Starting with the over. Dutch, really. Yeah. For their mills. Right. That's right. Um, you go along Montauk Highway, every town seems to have a mill pond. It's true. Everyone, I mean, that's that's the drive along Montauk Highway. You have a canal on one side and a pond on the other. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, a lot of people don't even realize that we have rivers here, that there's not, you know, these are, these are not natural lakes. I mean, I've stood in a, on, a, on a backyard once and talked to a landowner about the uh, the pond in the back of his house. And when I told him it, was, it, it, was an, it wasn't natural, it was an impounded river, you know, he looked at me like I had two heads, like, of course this is a pond. It's always been a pond. It's been a pond, you know, for a hundred years or more. So, mm. um, but there, you know, these are natural f tributaries. It's trying, we, we need to sort of have a paradigm shift to get people to think of them as tributaries again, and, mm. uh, and they need to be flowing. Uh, you mentioned Browns River in, in Bayport. Well, actually, it's uh, somewhat in, in Sable right, as well. Uh, I'm from Sable, and as you know, I would very much like to see um, some barriers taken down along there. Yep. Um, but, you know, so you look at the, the mill pond. There we go again. Yep, um, there's lots of mill ponds. And uh, there's, there's uh, one which, by all rights, should be part of uh, Browns River so that fish could swim upstream again yep. to spawn. Uh, but uh, people will say, well, you're going to spawn my lake view. And, uh, I mean, how, how do you, res I mean, how do you respond to No, it's to tough. It's a tough one. And people are, are uh, attached to and invested in these, these views and, and uh, in some cases, uses of these impoundments. Um, but we, we're not reinventing the wheel here. There were, there were uh, nearly 100 dams removed across the country last year. Uh, the, uh, the state of Pennsylvania removed like, almost 20 dams. I mean, there's, mm -hmm. there's lots of people who have, who have had this reaction before mm -hmm. and have said, uh, I, I, I can't possibly live without that impoundment. But, and then after the impoundment was removed, they came around. There's a lot of great stories out there for people who will say, yes, I... I was I fought hard against this, but now I love this beautiful flowing stream with this beautiful uh, meadow alongside of it. And so one of the things I think we'll, we will need to do as we try to advance this conversation is is to bring some of these people to Long Island and have them tell this story. I mean, there's. Uh, I mean, the picture that you had of the stream in, in Vermont it was yeah. a spectacular, beautiful, beautiful meadow. I mean, if you're to tell people, well, you may lose the pond, but you, you're back up uh, onto a nature preserve and, and all that wildlife. Yeah. Imagine your property values after all that. Yeah, and we make the case that, right, you get, you get more, in some cases, you get more usable land because some people actually own underneath these ponds. So that's they, true their too. property, usable property actually extends. Mm -hmm. And we're making the case to municipalities that in some cases they get more parkland, more room for trails, mm -hmm. uh, better birding habitat. You know, there's lots of other benefits that come with it. Mm -hmm. And then, the, you know, the piece that we're, tr we're trying to hit the, the leaders with is this idea of cost, that there's an economic analysis here. And I think we might try to flesh this out some more with some, with some economists, but this notion of, of the cost of maintaining dams. Mm. Uh, as you look into the future, and I know, you know sometimes politicians don't do that long-term planning, but if you're really thinking about the cost of maintaining this dam for decades in the future and dealing with all the invasive issues 
and the aquatics under, you know, that are going to have to be addressed. Um, it's a lot more expensive in most cases than taking out a dam. It's like shoveling sand against the sea with these invasives if the water's just going to sit there. Flowing water and it's right, problem solved. It's problem solved. Uh, I want to give a, a shout out to a, a friend of mine, uh, Jason Atkinson out mm -hmm. in Oregon. Sure. He succeeded, in, it's in today's paper, in having four hydroelectric dams removed from the Klamath River. 1,200 miles, yeah, uh, by, exec yeah. by executive order. Uh, one guy I met four years ago managed to, to uh, change that whole ecosystem. Yeah. And so that's, you know, that, that should give everybody uh, some encouragement. Yeah. Uh, and those, to, are, those are dams. I mean, right? those are, compared mm -hmm. to what we're talking about, much, mm -hmm. much more substantial structures and the cost of removing them. I mean, many of our dams on Long Island, you can just about breach with a shovel. <laughs> yes, yeah. that's true. Um, a lot of them are in the process of breaching themselves because they're so old. That's true. And that's so true. are we going to pay to keep them up, repair right. them? Right. No, that's the question. Hmm. Um, I'm just so impressed with what you, what you do. I, I can't wait to uh, fi find a dam or a stream where we could work together to, to uh, bring back the fish. Yeah, let's find one. Let's do it. We're looking for it. All right. uh, well, that would be all the time we have on Water Matters. I want to thank our guest again, uh, Enrico Nardone of uh, the Sea Tuck yep. Environmental Association. And uh, keep up the good work, and I thank hope you. to see you again soon. Great. Thanks. See you back.